mean guy that Jerry Broughton is. It's, this is why, despite being one of the great Renaissance scholars of our time, he's only being invited to Jaipur for the first time. He's, he's, already, he's already blotting his copybook here. <laughs> anyway, Jerry, seriously, is actually someone we should have had from the very beginning of this festival. He's everything that Jaipur is about. He's a scholar who brings incredible academic learning and research to books which are beautifully written, incredibly accessible, and which range way out of uh, any box that uh, anyone has tried to put Jerry into. Uh, I think you started off originally as a, as, as a, as a, a, literary, a, lit, a literary critic, and, uh, uh, but then has broached out into the history of geography and the history of maps, uh, into art history, um, the late King's Goods, which got him shortlisted for what was then the Samuel Johnson, is now the Bailey Gifford. Um, he is an astonishing speaker, too, so we have a treat in charge, in, in store for you. So what I've suggested that he does is that he lays out his float in his inimitable manner uh, and, uh, and talks to us about uh, his, my favorite of his books, This Orientile, which is an extraordinary revisionist take on Elizabethan England. Most of us assume that Islam first arrived in, in Western Europe, or specifically in Britain, in perhaps the 18th or the 19th centuries with Lascars coming in, uh, uh, with East India Company ships from Yemen and so on. Uh, but Jerry shows there is a whole history of intimate engagement uh, with the wider Arab and Islamic world, which has been completely written out of the history books, which is a, a history that we badly need to recover if we're to understand the way that the world has been far more globalized than any of us realized for far longer. And this is a theme that's run through this and your maps book. Um, anyway, he, I, he's one of my favorite speakers and one of my favorite writers, and I'm very, very pleased finally to get him here, despite his appalling behavior with microphones. And uh, uh, Jerry, take it away and, and give, us your, give us your spiel. Willie, thank you very much. It's amazing to be here. Thank you for all coming. What I'm going to do, uh, I hope you can see the images on the screen. I'm I'm literally just going to talk you through. I'm going to walk you through uh, these images. Um, and as Willie was saying, what I want to talk about is a sort of forgotten history, really, in terms of early Elizabethan England. We think of the Tudor period as exclusively about white, elite, male culture. That is not the case. This is research based on sort of 20 years of research about Anglo-Islamic relations, which I think tell a very different story about the period. And I'm going to end up saying about Shakespeare. So those of you who know your Othello very well, you'll know it ends up uh, with Othello talking about a turban Turk. So I'm going to end up there in 1601, 1602, but I'm going to start back here in 1550 with this image here. And this is an image, an English portrait of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent from 1550. This is 1550, okay? So we're going to start in the 1550s. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, religious conflict in this period, the Catholic Protestant divide, the conflict in this period between Protestants and, Elizabeth and, and, and Catholics. Um, what's interesting, I'm going to start with a figure um, in, uh, in Muscovy, in Persia, Anthony Jenkinson. Anthony Jenkinson goes to Persia in the 1550s, 1560s, and he meets uh, the Shah, the Shah, the Persian Shah, and this is the establishment of the birth of the Muscovy Company. The Muscovy Company is established in the 1560s, in 1562. Um, Jenkinson goes, he goes to Isfahan. He understands the distinction between Sunni and Shias. Um, he talks about that distinction. This is uh, Tudor Elizabethan in the 1560s. This then establishes the birth of the Muscovy Company in 1555. Now we talk about as the Muscovy Company, we think about that in terms of Russia, but this is effectively the English getting to Persia in the 1560s. English men and women understanding the distinctions between Sunni and Shia in the 1560s. My students in London don't understand that distinction between Sunni and Shia at the moment. So in terms of conflicts in the Middle East, let's just think a little bit about that and revise our understanding of what's happening in this Tudor period where Protestants are understanding that distinction and are actually starting to make an alliance between the other great heresy, according to Christianity, in the 16th century, which is Islam. So what happens 
is that Catholic propaganda in the first half of the 16th century understands Islam, doesn't see it as a religion in its own right, so sees it as a schism, a heresy. Protestantism, Protestantism under Luther is also therefore seen in exactly the same way. It is a heresy. And so what happens is you get what I call a conflation, a conflation of Protestantism with Islam. And that is something that Elizabeth I exploits. And I'm just showing you an image here. I hope you can see it um, on the screen, which is, um, can you see that? Can we, oh, sorry. This is a Catholic woodcut from the early 16th century. And can you see in the top left-hand corner, what you can see um, is a head of Luther. Luther wearing a turban. Protestant German Luther being shown by Catholics wearing a turban. The idea being that there's a conflation within the Catholic imagination between this new reformed Protestant religion and Islam, right? So that's in the 1520s. So by the 1550s, we've got English men in Persia trading, partly because what's happening is we've got, in this period, it's so relevant to what we're doing today, a theological Brexit, a moment where England steps away from the rest of Europe for religious reasons. The schism with Catholicism leaves England a rogue Protestant state from the 1550s when Elizabeth comes to the throne in 1558. And by 1570, she is officially expelled from the church. So this conflation, right, where Protestants, Protestants are making common cause with Islam is something that Elizabeth I then picks up. So in 1570, let's get the story to 1570, which is when Elizabeth is excommunicated formally from the Catholic Church. The English state becomes a Protestant state. She is expelled. What she then does is, as a result, and this is also a question about trade, the Muscovy Company is the first joint stock company which is established in the 1550s. Throughout the later 16th century under Elizabeth, you have a, another series of joint stock companies which involve merchants pulling money together to invest predominantly in the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa right, in trade because the state can't do it because Elizabeth doesn't have enough money and she's also worried about those political alliances. So the very specific way in which joint stock companies emerge comes from the politics and religion um, of the time and of this period. And what's extraordinary is what you then get is, and you've got a slide here from the early 1580s, in 1579, Elizabeth establishes a diplomatic exchange with Sultan Murad III in Istanbul to establish a political and a commercial treaty. And she says, you and I are people of the book. We do not believe in idolatry like Catholics, and therefore I'm reaching out to you to create an alliance. She does this in 1579-1580, the first English ambassador, a man called William Harborn, who's from Great Yarmouth, goes to Istanbul and establishes that trade. And the Catholic ambassadors who are there in Istanbul, the Spanish and the Italians, are really annoyed. And you can see just from this exchange that what they point out is that the English have come, they've sidestepped the way in which Elizabeth has been excommunicated. She's now a heretic. So Elizabeth says, great, I'm a heretic. I can trade with other heretics, so I'm gonna trade with the Ottomans. The Ottomans have no idea who Elizabeth I is. This small island on the edge of their world map ruled by a woman, and Murad for a long time doesn't even know who she is, but the exchanges of letters, which I'm gonna to come to in a second, I'll show you these in a second. But this is just an example of the way in which people are responding to the Anglo-Islamic alliance which has been established between Elizabeth and Murad. And this is the Spanish ambassador saying, this is outrageous. They're coming here, <coughs> they're getting preferential trade rates, and they're shipping arms to Istanbul. Because what is the only thing that the English have in the mid-16th century to trade in the world? Wool. Wool is not going to play very well in Persia, okay? It's a problem. So what you do have, though, is arms. So the English are shipping arms to Istanbul to support the Turkish wars with Persia and also with the Spanish Catholics. And Mendoza is here saying, you know, there's nothing we can do. Our hands are tied because they have a preferential trading agreement. There are then English men and women who are uh, uh, living and working across the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm going to show you examples of them converting to Islam 
And I'll tell you what, in the 1580s, when the English Protestants think that the Spanish are about to invade at any point, if you're sitting in Algiers, I think I'd convert to Islam. It looks like a better bet. That is the reality of what's happening in the mid-16th century in this period. We've seen the whole period the wrong way around, okay? Elizabethan England is not a big player in this world stage. It's about the Ottomans, yes, it's about the Spanish, it's about Persia and China. We, the English, are a spot in this geopolitical world. And Elizabeth is desperately trying to keep it going. And that's why you have this kind of alliance. And on the left here, I can just show you an example of Elizabeth writing to Murad. This very cordial correspondence, reaching out saying, I want to be a vassal state of you, right? I am the subject, and I'm writing to you. She's trying to big up herself as a sort of emperor, but she's really not. She claims that she rules Ireland a little bit, France, not at all. Okay, so it's a way of saying, look at me. And Murad goes, okay, fine. Look, you know, if you want to join in, then that's fine. On the right are letters which are held in London's public records office in Q, which are Murad's responses. And I show them there, written in Turkish, because my point is, we should be starting to look at those letters and these exchanges being as significant as you might talk about Elizabeth exchanges with the Spanish Emperor Philip II. In fact, they're more important because it establishes more of a connection than we've ever really realized. The treaty which is signed in 1580 between the English and the Ottomans are called the Capitulations. It's quite explicit that Elizabeth is a subject of the Ottoman Empire. Harbon is her man in Istanbul. The capitulations stay in place until 1922. Of course, we all know what happens then in terms of the Ottoman Empire, it becomes a republic. But that enduring alliance between the Ottoman Empire and the English is one that we've just completely missed. So my point is, many of us can't even look, and, and I say this openly, you know, I don't read Turkish, and had I another lifetime, one would retrain. And this is about doing collaborative work now with people globally to look at this material and say, yeah, these letters on the right should be part of the story that we tell, as well as the ones on the left of Elizabeth writing to Murad. So throughout the 1580s, what you have is an extraordinary commercial and a political alliance which is established. There are men and women living across that period of the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and what you've got is also a very significant economic investment. So 1580, you've got the establishment of the Turkey Company. By 1592, the Turkey Company's trade is so big, it overwhelms the trade with Venice. And again, we all talk about this here. Oh, Venice is so important in England. It's not. It's not as important as the trade that's going through Istanbul with the English and the alliance that they've made with the Turks. There are 19 ships, up to 300 tons, which are going on about 20 voyages uh, a year, right? Which is bringing in about 70,000 pounds each shipment. That's a return of 300%. So don't tell me that this is just an insignificant sort of exchange that's going on. Now, the point is that, yes, it is to some extent rail politic. I am not saying, and it's really important, I'm not saying that somehow Elizabeth is this great, tolerant ruler who understands Islam. I don't think that's the case. It's a very strategic alliance, but it's still one we haven't really been told much about. But the consequences on the ground of people who are living and working and just getting on with their lives in the Eastern Mediterranean are tremendous. And this is one of my favorite images. This is of a man, would you believe, called Samson Rowley. And Samson Rowley is from Great Yarmouth. And in 1577, Samson Rowley is captured by Turkish pirates off Algeria. He is castrated, he converts to Islam, and he then becomes the imperial eunuch and treasurer of Algiers with his own palace. Now, if you look at that image, you can see almost that there's a sort of, you're drawn to the sense of what's happened to him in terms of his castration. But he's also now an elite figure, another turban figure. We started with a turban figure. I'm halfway through. Here's another figure in 1577 who is living and working and practicing as a Muslim from the late 1570s in Algeria. And my friend William Harborn, who's in Istanbul as the English ambassador at this time, writes to Samson Rowley, 
who's now called Hassan Aga. And he says, Samson, you and I are both from Great Yarmouth. <laughs> Do you want to come back? And Samson Rowley, now Hassan Aga, says, you've got to be joking. I'm living in a palace in Algiers. The weather's really good, and I'm, I'm not coming back to England. And he never comes back. And, and it kind of sums up, I mean, the question of what the reality of that conversion is is hard to assess. I have one example of a, of a Muslim, a Turk, who converts uh, to Anglicanism, uh, but that, there's just one example. Against a whole raft of examples of conversions that happen, some forced, but some clearly not forced, because at this time, Protestantism is a little tiny theology, a rogue state on the corner of Europe, and it's not clear that it, it's really going to play out. Okay? So I think we need to sort of think about that in terms of how we then start to understand both the trade of the period, the diplomacy of the period, and the art and culture and the drama. So I'm going to come to Shakespeare um, in a moment. This is one of the most extraordinary and slightly controversial images that I want to show. This is a representation on the left of Elizabeth I, and on the right, possibly Murad III, and possibly the prophet. This is the first English representation that we have of those figures, and top right, the first English representation of a mosque. This, would you believe it, is in a country house in Derbyshire called Hardwick Hall, which I discovered when I went up there one day, broke a trip to my hometown in Bradford, took my kids in, I was covered in ice cream, and I went, why do you have an embroidery of the Prophet Muhammad in the corner? And the lady from the National Trust said, I don't know, I'll go and find out. And she ran away and she never returned. Which, which again tells you a lot about the way in which we're thinking about English national history. And this for me has become such an important piece that here are women embroidering a representation um, of Muslims in the 1580s. It's called Fides, it's uh, the, Italian, uh, the, the Latin for faith. So it clearly seems to be an image which is a fantasy of the Turkish subjection to Elizabeth. But, you know, still, actually what we know now about the history is it's the other way around. And if we do a little bit of history, we get a lot more understanding of what's happening nationally. And I think that that really works with the drama of the period, because part of the book, and I wanted to rather controversially call the book Shakespeare uh, and Islam, um, and my publisher wasn't very happy about this, but did you know that Shakespeare refers to the Prophet Muhammad? No, because nobody here has probably read Henry IV, Henry VI, part one. It's one of the more obscure Shakespeare plays. But here is a reference where Shakespeare talks about the prophet Muhammad, says, was Muhammad in inspired with a dove? And this is an apocryphal Christian medieval uh, story about the way in which the prophet places corn behind his ear so that the dove comes down and he claims that it's, it's an inspiration. It's the, the sacredness of the dove is whispering prophecies in his, in his ears. So it's a sort of apocryphal, it's a rather negative story which is told about Islam. But nevertheless, you have Shakespeare talking about the prophet Muhammad. We know from this period that the drama, after all this history that I'm telling you about, hits the Elizabethan stage. It is a wild fascination that you have with Islamic scenes and characters and settings in all of Elizabethan drama. We know, and I teach it, it's my day job, you know, I teach, I teach the period's drama, and we know that Christopher Marlowe's Tamburlaine really kick-starts what we call the Tudor drama of this period in the late 1580s, it's replete with stories about Persians, Saracens, Turks, Moors, for those of you who know the play. Shakespeare follows that fashion because Marlowe sets the tone. And in that play, very controversially, Marlowe shows Tamburlaine burning the Quran. Now again, just think about what history stands behind that kind of representation to uh, an audience in London in 1588 talking about the Quran, talking about Islam. Marlowe had clearly read the Quran in French. Shakespeare, I'm not as convinced, but he's again picking up those references. It is hidden in plain view, because this is a moment, of course, before empire, before the discourse of Orientalism. So it's been washed out, and I know this, because it's my dear white male elite colleagues who just don't want to talk about this and haven't for a generation. And, and more. And now I think with what's happening in a kind of 
contested multicultural Britain with the Islamophobia that we see, this is a story that we need to tell ourselves because it's central not only to the history but also to the drama of the period. Between 1579 and 1624, I have at least 62 plays which have Islamic characters, settings, or themes. That, I can tell you from what survives in this period, is a lot. And I can talk to you about them if you want, okay? Um, the word Islam and Muslim does not enter the English language until 15, 6, 1615. But that doesn't mean, as people used to say to me, well, there's no representation of Islam. Well, synonyms are used, Ottoman, Saracen, Persian, Moor, as the Protestant English, with the alliance that they've established, try, try and start to understand what is this theology that we seem to be in alliance with as well, and seems to be saving us from Spanish, Catholic, European aggression, which might at any time overwhelm us. There's another interesting side story that William Harborn uh, works with the Turks to create an aggressive uh, military and naval alliance between the English and the Turks in 1588. And I've always claimed that that splits the Spanish Armada that goes in 1588. And when I did this, and it turned up on the BBC News, people went mad about this, saying, you can't say this. It's absolutely outrageous. It's about Francis Drake and his bowls. And it's a load of nonsense. It's a load of balls. So it's rubbish, because actually it's about a much more wider geopolitical story and England's alliance with Islam. It also goes further than that. So I started in Persia with the story about Anthony Jenkinson. Well, here are the hilarious Shirley brothers. So this is uh, Anthony Shirley on the left, who gets to Isfahan in 1600, 1601. He works for Shah Abbas. He goes around the European Catholic uh, kingdoms and courts, calling, get this, this is how complex, hopefully, if your head is spinning a bit, great, I hope so, because this, is a man who is a Catholic, who flees England. He then goes to make a political alliance with a Shia kingdom in Persia because he's opposing the Anglo-Sunni alliance with the Turks. I mean, just get your head around that and your head around his brother on the right. This is Robert Shirley who goes with him and is the fencing master with the Shah, right? And that's the kind of Hello Magazine version of the English in Persia. This is Robert Shirley. And Van Dyke meets him in Rome in 1622. He's married a Persian princess, and Van Dyke says, you're brilliant, I want to paint you. I mean, there he is in full sort of oriental regalia. Um, and it's interesting because they pop up in Twelfth Night. There's a reference to the, uh, the Sophie's fencing master, which is clearly a reference to Shirley. And as a northerner, a northern Englander, I can say this, so it's Shirley. So there's a phrase in the play where they say, surely you know who this is. And of course, that's what they'd say. And I'm from Bradford, so I say, surely. Um, and there are the Shirley brothers, okay? And I'm going to end with this figure. This is a guy called Muhammad al Onuri, And al Onuri is the Moroccan ambassador who comes to England in the summer of 1600 and stays for six months just before Shakespeare writes Othello. So this is another story which I haven't gone into, which is the alliance that the Elizabethans have with the Barbary states, modern day Morocco, um, which is established really from the 1550s. The Barbary company is founded in 1585. It's not a joint stock company, it's a bit different. Um, but the Barbary company is established just like the Turkey company to sell arms to the Barbary states, uh, to the ruler Al-Mansur um, in, in the Barbary states, in exchange for saltpeter, which comes from Morocco, for salt and spices and sugar. Every school kid is taught in England that Elizabeth I never smiles in her portraits because she has terrible teeth. And everybody says because she eats too much sugar. It's Moroccan sugar. And again, it's just a sort of important point to make that, that again, hidden literally behind her lips, is the story of that Anglo-Islamic alliance. Look at all the portraits, by the way. You know, all the early portraits of Henry VIII, he's wearing second-hand Ottoman designs. You know, look at me. Well, it's actually sort of, you know, last season's Ottoman hand-me-downs. You, you look at the jewelry that Elizabeth's wearing, where do you think it comes from? Yeah. And then you see a figure like this, Al-Onuri, so he arrives 
stays on the strand. He's paid for by the Barbary company, stays on the strand. He has high-level meetings with Elizabeth. I start the book with, there's an account of him being in Whitehall um, at Elizabeth's Succession Day celebrations in 1600. He's an honored guest. He meets Elizabeth twice um, at high-level negotiations about establishing, get this, an Anglo-Islamic North African alliance to reconquer Catholic Spain, a reconquista using the English Navy and money from the, uh, from the Moroccan conquest of West Africa, which has brought in a lot of gold. Elizabeth delighted because she thinks this is going to bring in money to the urgently needed coffers. And Al Mansur uh, Al Anuri, <coughs> we lost the image. Can we get the image back up? Slide, Can we just get this last slide back up of Al Anuri? That's great, thank you. Um, Al Anuri stays for six months in London. He lives on the Strand with his retinue. It, it's described how they slaughter their meat halal, it's described how they pray. Um, very detailed description of how he goes and meets Elizabeth. They speak in Spanish and Italian. Um, and I think that this portrait is painted. It's now in the Shakespeare Institute in Stratford-upon-Avon. And they have no idea what to do with this painting. It's an anonymous painting which I think was designed, was painted to celebrate what they assumed would be at any moment an Anglo-Moroccan alliance against the Spanish. It doesn't come off, but it simply doesn't come off, not because suddenly the the Elizabethans suddenly get cold feet about trading and making an alliance with an Islamic empire. Elizabeth simply calls out the precedent that she has with a much more longer standing alliance with the Ottomans. And of course at the time the Barbary states are in conflict with the Ottomans as well. So again, you know, we forget about this, but people like Walsingham, you know, Drake, Rawley, all these people, all the elite figures within the Elizabethan court all knew what was going on. So in the end, this alliance founders I'm fascinated by this because I've talked to uh, Nabil Matar, Willie knows, who's one of the great uh, historians of this period, who's written a lot about captive narratives and conversion. Um, and I draw a lot on Nabil's work, which is brilliant. I've talked to Nabil about this. And we have an interesting line that we think he's probably Al, uh, Al Anuri. Look at that image. This is a guy who's staring you right down the, the barrel. Right? He's kind of handsome, sexy, dangerous figure. This is Othello, right? A guy who might save you, might sleep with you, uh, might show you his sword. Um, this is not the kind of lost, dispossessed, you know, orientalist figure that we've sort of assumed Othello is. And Nabil and I wonder about this image, that we think he's probably Spanish. He's probably a Spanish Muslim. He's probably left Spain because of the Catholic persecution, gone to Morocco, and therefore, he's a perfect cosmopolitan figure to come to London in 1600 to represent uh, the Moroccan interests. Um, we have no portraits of his ruler, Ahmad al-Mansur, because, of course, again, the legislation against those kind of iconic images within a more orthodox form of Islam. But al Anuri here doesn't have a problem with being painted. The alliance doesn't come off. In 1601, he leaves and he's never seen again, and it's the end of that story. But of course, what then happens within a year, which is why I date Othello at around 1601, 1602, Shakespeare writes Othello, the Moor of Venice, the Moor yeah, from North Africa. Now, we've all tended to see that figure, and we've quite importantly talked about Othello for a generation as a black figure and the racism that surrounds that. That's important, but I think the history now tells us that this is about theology, and he's a much more powerful figure than we imagine. He is, as the play tells us, a convert from Islam to Christianity. He himself says that. He talks about his baptism. He's obviously a Muslim. Now, what Shakespeare's done, and I'm not saying he necessarily meets al Anuri, but there's a whole generation of Anglo-Islamic alliances, connections, exchanges, conversions, which have gone on, which lead you up to a play like Othello. And it's not exclusively so. Shakespeare starts his career, Titus Andronicus, if some of you know it, has R and the Moor. In the mid-1590s, you have uh, The Merchant of Venice, which again, we all think about in terms of anti-Semitism, but we often forget that one of Portia's uh, suitors is the Prince of Morocco.
So throughout Shakespeare's career, he's sort of been seeding these ideas. He's responded to Marlowe and the massive fashion for representing Muslims on the stage throughout the 1590s. Everybody in the 1590s has to do a Turk or Moor play. Shakespeare doesn't because everybody's doing Moors. Everybody's doing Turks, so he does Moors instead. The more Tides Andronicus, the more in Merchant of Venice, the more in Othello. But if you know the play and you think about the ending of the play, what happens is he talks about, just before he kills himself, he says, he has this fancy, he talks about being in Aleppo, which again, you know, seems to me a sort of tragic irony. How far has this play gone from Morocco in the west to Aleppo in the east via Venice? And he says, tell a story about how I once took a Venetian by the throat. Um, a, 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 a Venetian who was being attacked by a Turk, a malignant and a turbaned, turbaned Turk, and the fellow says, tell everybody that I took that Turk and I smote him, I stabbed him thus. But in that moment, he's killed himself. So in that one split second, a fellow is a Turk. So my point is that Shakespeare never puts a Turk on stage apart from that one split second, and then he kills him. I'm going to leave it there, but also to open up to questions, because um, I hope you may have questions about the kind of this history, which if you know your Shakespeare, might be a bit of a shock and a surprise to you. But as I say, I think in our current moment with what's going on in the UK, with the culture wars, with the Islamophobia, with the way in which the government is ramping up that kind of conflict, these are the kind of histories that we are starting to retell, and many people here are doing them as well, um, across different cultures, across different languages, David Vivas is here, he's going to be talking on Sunday about this. Uh, Satnam Sanghera has just written Empire World, a way in which at this moment it's important to start to retell these stories and be truthful about the history that in a sense we've lost or for various reasons we've occluded. And so that's where I finish and you take over. Jerry, fabulous. Two stories I'd just love you to tell, which fit in so well with all that. The story of Elizabeth's correspondence for body shop products from Istanbul, and the story of this idea of the colonization, the joint Moro Anglo Moroccan colonization of America. Could you quickly tell those two stories, because they're so great? So there's an interesting story about when uh, Elizabeth, after the death of Murad, Elizabeth starts to uh, correspond with uh, his mother, the Sultana. So there's a fascinating exchange of, uh, of goods that go between the two of them in terms of cosmetics and soaps and silks. Now, of course, again, the gendering of this period has tend to ignore that, but I think it's a really important part, especially if you think about the drama of the period, because the way in which, uh, how to describe, you know, we don't even know the language here, if I talk about oriental women, that's absolutely wrong, but representations of women from Islamic or Eastern cultures are always denigrated within the drama of the period. And actually, that becomes a sort of high-level way in which they massage the politics, the exchanges between the Sultana um, and Elizabeth. And one of the great stories and outcomes of that is that Elizabeth, in 1599, then decides to send a, a mechanical organ, a musical organ, out to Istanbul uh, to give to the Sultana and the new Sultan. And it's taken by a man from Lancashire. Um, who is just a working man from Lancashire called Thomas Dallam. And Dallam takes the organ out. He, uh, puts it, it, he puts it in the Topkapi Sarai. He plays it for the Sultan who says, fabulous, play again. He plays again. He says, you must stay, you must convert to Islam. He says, you must look at the harem. He's the first man to look uh, into the harem in Topkapi Sarai. He says how he peeps in and he sees the woman's thighs covered in silk. I mean, it's this kind of, kind of very voyeuristic sort of image that you get. Um, so it's, it succeeds, but he then says he wants to leave. And he leaves, and he's given a, a dragoman, an Ottoman interpreter, who he calls in his narrative, he says he's a perfect Turk. He says he travels back through Greece, and then finally his interpreter says, right, I'm leaving and going back now. Dallam then discovers that the interpreter is an Englishman from Lancashire, from Warrington, down the road from where Dallam's been brought up. This is in the 1599, 1600, kind of extraordinary, right? One goes back and happily clearly embraces and has embraced Islam, and Dalham goes home. So the story about Dalham's organ is kind of extraordinary. And then as Willie says, the story at the end of this period um, is fascinating because Elizabeth's plan 
is a quite open one to try and colonize the new world. So the English pirates are already playing hit and run with the, with the Spanish in the Caribbean. She now has the chance to put that to work with the kind of money from the Barbary states. So it's clearly a high level discussion which is absolutely gonna come off. It's just she realizes that that's gonna really annoy the Ottomans. So she steps back from it. But you know, within, uh, within just a few months, of all these negotiations, don't forget, and this is where Willie's great book, The Anarchy, begins, which is December 1600, Elizabeth then signs off on the creation of the East India Company, the great joint stock company that does what we all know it does and partly why we're all here to some extent, for good or bad. And I think that that's extraordinary because you do not get that joint stock company being created without the earlier joint stock companies, without the Muscovy Company in 1555, without the Turkey Company in 1580, that then becomes the Levant Company. That's the way in which the English understand how to do that kind of business. So it seeds what happens with the East India Company in 1600, and then everything that flows from that. Jay, will you talk a little bit more about that? Because it's an important point. One of the um, speakers who had pulled out for personal reasons at the last minute was Phil Stern, who was meant to come here, talking about companies as the agents of early imperialism. I think everyone here assumes that the British came here partially as a nation state, the British, uh, but it's not the way. It, 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 the Elizabethans operate through commercial companies, through the Elizabethan equivalent of Facebook or ExxonMobil or whatever, powerful companies are the original imperialists. Do you want to just talk yeah. about that? Yeah, and of course Elizabeth does that eh, you know, because she wants to enrich the state because they've no money, but she doesn't want to be liable for it. So she encourages the joint stock operations, which are usually bunches of uh, city merchants. Which are privatized, for-profit yeah. businesses. Yeah, so they're privatized for profit. You know, you put your money in and then you take it out if you profit. I mean, it's a crude way of thinking about the joint stock, but it's a new, it, it has been in place in Northern Europe, but it's the first time it's really kind of gone global. But of course, it's not about empire. This is not a story about slavery. And it's important to sort of acknowledge both that it becomes one, but it isn't at this point. The Elizabethan forays westwards are slightly different. So Hawkins, John Hawkins is slaving in West Africa. But the connections through corporate, uh, the corporate ideals that are going on with Muscovy and with the Levant and with the Ottomans are very much about negotiation, trade, and exchange. They're not about empire. They're not about colonies or plantations, which is what's being described in the West, in the Americas. That's not what's at stake here. And it's very much about the sense in which they are a small fish in a very large pond. Nobody really knows. That's why they kind of succeed, because they're just getting on with their own stuff. And the Ottoman response, Murad's response, is of course that kind of classic, and it's not necessarily progressive, but it's a classic multicultural response. He says, I'll let anybody in because it's a sign of my power. The English, of course, are much more terrified of that. And in Ireland, they're just ethnically cleansing every Catholic that they can see. But they also know to be strategic that when they're dealing with Al-Mansur in Morocco and when they're dealing with Murad in Istanbul, that's a very different story. Yeah, it is not one about on the other foot there. The power uh, is entirely. It, we, we we just look at it the wrong way. That, you know, um, Murad talks about he can't get Elizabeth's name right for the first few letters. He's just no idea who she is. Isabel of Angleterre. Where is Angleterre? Can, have we got a map for it? Oh, it's we don't need to trade with these people. They need to come to us. So what's interesting is that except they provide the armament, the armaments, the lead and the tin, absolutely, without which the Ottomans can't attack Vienna. Or yeah, whatever. I mean, no wonder we've never had an ethical foreign policy in the UK because it goes right back to the 1560s when we've been happily arming anybody who will <laughs> give us something back in exchange because we don't have much to export. That's the kind of that's the bizarre story about this early period. So they come here first of all. They're trying to sell wool blankets to the Mughals. And yeah, that's going to work. <laughs> just not interested in it. Oh, what else have and we got? And occasionally they buy them for the horses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, horse yeah. And again, there's so many little bits that we could go on about this. I mean, one of the great things when you have the first exchanges uh, between Elizabeth and with Harborn in Istanbul is that what's, uh, and I think I put it up on that clip, that Elizabeth is authorizing the stripping of Catholic churches, the lead from Catholic churches, is being used to make armaments which is then used and shipped out to the Turks to kill Catholics from Catholic churches. I mean, you don't get more sort of bizarrely symbolic than that in terms of religion meets trade meets nascent empire. But this is not a story about empire. 
And it's really difficult because I'm the first to support what comes later around stories uh, you know, and accounts of what happens with empire and slavery. Absolutely. But I think if we assume it's always already there within English national culture, we give too much agency. You know, Elizabeth was just, just sort of responding on the hoof. You know, this was not some crafty plan by these kind of clever Brits, not at all. This was about just surviving. It was just trying to survive because up to 1588 and really after, because you know, there are more armadas that come. We forget about this. It is just a speck on the edge and they are seen as a terrorist state. You know, we just get these whole arguments. Full of pirates. Right? It's full of pirates and they're endlessly, you know. Johnny Depp's forebears. Are... Yeah. And, yeah, and they're supporting, you know, the sort of arming of the Dutch who are just sort of killing Catholics willy-nilly in the Low Countries and assassinating wherever they So, you know, we need to retell this story, you know, of Merry England, you know, and that's why I call the book this Orient Isle because, of course, it's spinning off the Richard II, this sceptred isle, you know, this, you know, this royal teeming womb of royal kings. It's just, that's a fantasy, because that's what the drama does. It gives you a certain vision of it. But when you look at the history, and I'm the first to say, we need to do more of this. This is only the beginning, and we need to work collaboratively like the social sciences do. We need to get into the archives in Istanbul to see, again, what other stories can be told. But then we need to know the politics of what's going on geopolitically now, because if I then say to you, and we need to get into the archives in places like Baghdad, well, there's not much left, thanks to the Americans. Or if we need to get into, you know, the archives in the Middle East and we know what's good. Yeah, you know where I'm going. <laughs> that is a real problem in terms of what we do intellectually, but also politically because of what's happening in the world at the moment and the way we want to retell our history. And we're, we're hearing this a lot. You know, the Tories are telling us, coming back, coming back in York, saying, you know, we shouldn't stop rewriting history. Well, as Satnam Sanger has pointed out, and we would all do, really, as historians who work in this area, that's what we endlessly do. It's why we do the work that we do. You end up, you find new material, and you rewrite that history. That's absolutely right. We're always doing it. That's okay. That's what our job is. Jerry, one last question before we open it up for questions. I was very interested at the beginning. You talked about how the Elizabethans are looking on Islam not as a religion in itself, mm. but as a heretical version of Christianity. Now, that obviously has a very long history. St. John Damascene, at the time of the first Islamic invasions, talks about it as uh, uh, Islam as a, as a form of the Aryan Christian heresy. Yeah. But I had no idea that continued up as, as late as this, that yeah. they don't understand Islam despite the Crusades, despite everything, as a separate yeah. religion in itself. Yeah. Well, the Quran is only being uh, translated e uh, into Latin. There are earlier versions. But even in the 16th centuries, there's a very garbled French translation. And we think Marlowe reads it, because, of course, Marlowe's being a gay spy in Paris. So he's reading the Quran, because you would do, wouldn't you? Um, but we, we, st we don't have much of the, the theological debates which are trying to understand Islam in its own right. Of course, it starts in the 1610s, 1620s, when you get uh, professorships at Cambridge and Oxford um, working on the languages and the religion of the period. But that in itself is a, is a story that Edward Said then tells about Orientalism. That's how intellectual and academic Western work then, of course, intellectually colonizes that theology. But in the period, there's clearly an understanding. You know, Elizabeth's letters talk about Christ, but she's very careful to not talk about Christ as the Son of God because she knows that Islam, of course, sees Christ as a prophet so she sort of massages the account through that. So there clearly is, through, I think, people like Walsingham and Burley, there is a whispering understanding, if it's very mangled, of, of the theology of Islam. Over to you guys. First hand up here, gentleman with the grey hair and the blue shirt. Yep, stand up, sir. Get, can we get a microphone? Because uh, I think they have to record. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the Armada and Drake. That must have ruffled a lot of feathers. Now, that must have ruffled a lot of feathers, especially of my Royal Naval colleagues. I'm from the Indian Navy. Uh, my question to you is that what was Islam's contribution towards the destruction of the Armada? Because you mentioned it. Yeah. It's just about offering a slightly different perspective. It's not the destruction, but what happens is that Harborn, Harborn sabotages a Spanish-Ottoman peace treaty. And by doing that, I think Philip II is very, very wary of the armada that he can launch in 1588 because, of course, they're dealing on two fronts. They're thinking about, it's a bit like the Americans, you know, you've got the fleet in the Mediterranean, and then you have the fleet in the Atlantic. So what are you going to send? 
And if you're going to put all your, if you, all your energies into the armada, do you leave yourself then exposed on your eastern flank? So it's not that they're literally fighting them, but I think it's just part of a diplomatic game that is being played. And I just want that story to be acknowledged and told because, again, it buys back into this plucky national story of England's survivalism, which is just wrong. It's a sort of Victorian fantasy, right? It's just a boy's own story. Let's just be sensible about it, and let's tell the history from the diplomatic correspondence and what we know. So One more question quickly. Gentleman in the yellow shirt, hand raised at the back. Yeah. Yeah. You, sp you spoke about uh, the Turkish having companies to do this trade and all of that. And when we speak about economic history and all that, we talk about how the Dutch sort of had the first stock exchange and the joint stock companies, which made it possible for, you know, armies to cross over and do the sort of trade which doesn't really have to be funded by royal funding per se. So when you speak about the Turks having these kind of companies, how did they differ? Because you say this was before the 1600s, right? So how did it... How did it sort of inform the joint stock companies to come later? Were there similarities and was there something the joint stock companies later learned from them and that you could see surviving into the joint stock companies that the Dutch and the British later made? Yes, yeah, so, the, the, so just to clarify, so the, the Turks aren't dealing in similar sort of ways of trade, so it doesn't really affect because the trade is so small relative for them. For the English, it's big, but it's not for them. But I think that what it establishes is a certain way in which that kind of joint stock operates in later periods. And I mean, that's the story really that Willie picks up with the East India Company story. So for me, it, it sort of ends in 1603. Um, and that commercial exchange takes a different route because what James I does is when James comes, he says, I don't want this. I don't want anything to do with it. If you want to do that trade, you can get on with it. But he has a much more hardline theology where Elizabeth's saying, don't tell, don't ask. Whereas James is saying, no, 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 no. So in a way, that allows the merchants to get on with what they want to do. But I don't think that, and as yet, but this is what, it's a really good question in the sense of we need to know how the Turkish archives are telling us stories about what then happens. And, and I'll be the first to say we don't know enough about that. And that's the story. Because, you know, I, I tell the story and I'm very open about it because I can't speak for that Turkish Ottoman tradition because that's what Edward Said taught us. That is Orientalism, and I can't do that. I can tell you what I see from what I look at when I look at the archive from the perspective of Britain, in a way. We but should also say that very similar stuff is going on with the early East India, the first few East India Company voyages and the Mughals and the Deccan Sultanates. You're getting the same sort of characters who are taking the organ out to Istanbul. There's a guy called Robert Truly who's a trumpeter. And Robert truly goes out to, I think it's Jahangir's court, uh, plays, his, plays his trumpet. Um, then, having gone over to turn Turk, become a Muslim, he then leaves the Mughals to go and join Ibrahim Adil Shahi in Bijapur. Uh, and some other East India Company uh, uh, embassy finds again this, uh, I can't remember if it's from Lancashire or where, he's, where he is, or Yorkshireman, I think. Um, but he, uh, he ends up in, in, in the Deccan. And, and you have all these loose Englishmen, yeah. half converted to Islam, yeah. on the make, doing much better here than they were doing at home. Yeah. And of course, we just want to seal off that story about the porousness of those forms of identity. The Victorians just want to seal it off. And that's, I think, what we're challenging. We're trying to unpick that narrative. And of course, the East India Company office records are very much defined by the Victorian period. You know, and Willie knows more about this than I do. They just burn most of it. It's just gone. Uh, it's just we're still, working. There's with still 35 miles in the yeah. basement of the yeah. British yeah. Library. Yeah. <laughs> so but but a lot of us to look yeah. at. Yeah. But a lot is gone. You know, when I had a graduate student who was working on the early records, we, he had to retrain as a Victorianist effectively because the point was there just wasn't enough left in the early periods. So we have that real gap. It's a real omission. Um, and that's what we struggle with, which is why the question For is... For the company, there's really good stuff, though. There's all the early voyages. Yeah. It's all in, in secretary hands. All you need to learn is that, and then yeah. off you go. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we did, this, we did this event, in a way, or a version of it, in uh, Jaipur in London uh, last summer. And Nandini Das then took up the story. So her book, Courting India, literally takes up where I leave off. Um, and talks about the, the kind of exchanges with Thomas Rowe, who's the first ambassador. She was here last year and did a yeah. job. Incidentally, and Nandini, who's from Calcutta, has just won every available uh, non-fiction prize this year. It's had an incredible clean sweep. So local girl 
did Make well. Good. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, great. All right, big round of applause for Jerry Thank Brutton, you. who we must get back many other times. <laughs>